rest of lives, which um, were excellent. One was a life of community leadership, and the other was a life of uh, study of the cosmos. Um, so <clears throat> we may or may not agree with him about that. Um, but I put that over as showing that the Greek philosophers themselves were well aware that an excellent life might be very different for different people. <coughs> okay. All right. To get s now, what I want to do is uh, see if we can say anything about what this excellent life, this target that we might be aiming at, uh, amounts to. And to do that, I want to describe two lives which um, I hope you'll agree with me miss the target by quite a bit, uh, although neither is particularly bad. Right? Okay, first of all, there is Elaine. Elaine is in her 40s and lives alone except for her affectionate dog. She is never married and has no children. Her only family is her sister Stella, who is married and has two children, and although they are on friendly terms and enjoy each other's company, they are not particularly close. Elaine enjoys a fairly simple, undemanding, and stress-free life. She has an easy and pleasant job in a flower shop, where she arranges bouquets, a job she enjoys since flowers and plants are at the center of her life. At home, she has a garden, which she lovingly tends. And she belongs to a group of garden buffs who often get together to share gardening experiences and techniques, as well as to praise one another's gardening achievements. Elaine has no interests outside plants and flowers, except for mystery novels, which she reads almost every evening before retiring. Generally speaking, she is very content with life. And then there is her sister, Stella. Stella is married to George, and they both have careers. Stella as a primary school teacher and George as a mechanical engineer. They have two young children, Ralph and Evelyn, who are themselves in primary school. Stella takes her career very seriously and is constantly thinking up new ways to stimulate her pupils. She has received several awards for her teaching, but she is often in conflict with her principal, who she thinks re doesn't really understand what early education is all about, and she's probably right. Stella is also very concerned with her children's welfare, the welfare and education, and makes great efforts to see that they get the right food and join the right sports teams and get good exercise, etc. Um, she has words with the coaches about this. With all these things to think about, Stella frequently does not sleep well and finds that she is often tired and irritable. George is a loyal and devoted husband, but Stella finds she doesn't have much time alone with him and their sex life is minimal. Once a year, the family takes a three-week vacation to Hawaii but Stella finds that even then, she is so busy with the kids that she doesn't really have much time to relax. All in all, although she conscientiously does the things that need to be done, she doesn't really enjoy doing them very often. All right, now, Elaine's life, I think, fails to hit the mark. I'm hoping you agree with me, but if you disagree, you'll have plenty of opportunity to express that. Um, uh, doesn't have anything that's very admirable about it. And I emphasize the word admirable. Right? I'll come back to that. Elaine is happy, but she's happy doing rather mundane things, and her life never gets beyond that into anything one would want to praise very much. Stella's life, on the other hand, has a lot in it which is admirable. Her conscientiousness with regard to her children and her career is worth much praise, but it lacks enjoyment or pleasure. Now, the ancient philosophers that are in the Socratic tradition, and not all of them are, the skeptics were not in the Socratic tradition, but the ones that are in the Socratic tradition, that is believed that there is this art to living well, 
thought life had to have both these aspects, both the aspect of being admirable and being enjoyable in order to be excellent. One has to enjoy living, living the life one is living, and one has to be living in a way which is genuinely admirable. All right. The first aspect, the aspect of, or rather, the, yeah, the first aspect, the enjoyable aspect, is what in philosophy we call the subjective side because it, it, it's really a matter of how you feel about your life, right? And with regard to that, of course, you're in a better position to know whether you're enjoying life than uh, most other people. But with regard to the admirable side, you're not. Other people can be in just as good a position, if not better than you, to say whether your life is admirable. So that's an objective side to it. So I think it's important to remember that there may be two sides to this business of living excellently, right? the subjective and the objective. I'm not going to say much about the <clears throat> subjective side. Maybe Mr. Anelsky will say something about that in uh, four weeks' time. Um, instead, <clears throat> I'm going to concentrate on the other side, the admirable side, um, and say a few things about that, which um, some of which I hope you will agree with others, which I, I expect to get a lot of disagreement. All right. First of all, these uh, philosophers in the Socratic tradition <coughs> excuse me, thought that immorality made any life the opposite of admirable. That is despicable, no matter what else was true of it. And maybe we can agree with them on that. I'm thinking of immorality as dishonesty, fraud, disrespect for others, cowardice, people like Bernie Madoff, right? Okay, so um, this, um, um, they would say that a life sort of spent doing things in, that, in, in ways like that is certainly despicable and the opposite of admirable. All right, secondly, um, except for one school, the Epicureans, they thought that uh, being moral was less a matter of external behavior than of having a real love of honesty, fairness, loyalty, etc. Um, the motive for the behavior matters, right? It's not just doing the right thing. It's doing it because one recognizes it to be the right thing and one has respect for what's right. Okay. Now, the first question I would like to raise is whether being moral in this latter way, not just doing the right thing, but doing it for the right motive, that is because you respect what's right, um, is that sufficient for an excellent life? Pleasure will come into it, Aristotle says, if you genuinely love what's right. Because then in doing what's right, you'll enjoy doing what's right. And doing what's wrong will seem repellent to you. And if you happen to do what's wrong, you will be uh, in a state of total dissatisfaction with yourself. So the pleasure aspect, the, sub the uh, subjective side is not excluded by this possibility that just being a moral person, behaving morally for the right motives, is what suffices for the excellent life. But now here, <clears throat> I think we have to ask this sort of question. Suppose a person was living a perfectly moral life and living morally for the right motive, wouldn't still their life be improved if we added either or both of two other things? Achievement is one of them, 
and friendship is the other. Okay. All right, now, to uh, focus on this question, I want to uh, give you two other lives. Okay. Herman. Herman is a lawyer who handles suits arising from car accidents. <clears throat> In all his professional dealings, he is completely scrupulous and sometimes even compassionate. He does this not from a desire to make more money, but from his respect for what it means to be a good person. This comes out in other sides of his life where he is generous and helpful. But he lacks much in ambition, never pushes himself to achieve a great uh, reputation or notable success in his field. He avoids other areas of the law where he might have had a bigger impact. He never even considers a career in politics or serving in professional associations. But he is very content with his life and has time for his family and family vac vacations, which he enjoys immensely. All right. And then there is Sheila. Okay. Sheila is also a lawyer, but she has chosen the field of civil rights and makes a specialty out of defending the rights of aboriginals in their battles with the police and other authorities. She too is totally scrupulous, and not just because that helps her business, but because the whole idea of moral crookedness is totally repellent to her. She often takes cases pro bono, where the client has little or no money, and has been has been particularly hard done by. She has received a national reputation in this field and is called upon by people from all over the country. Moreover, she has written a book about the plight of Aboriginal people in Canadian cities, a book greeted with great critical acclaim. She is never married, but this allows her to devote herself to her work, which she takes great satisfaction from. It means a lot to her that she has made a difference in the treatment of Aboriginal people across the land. All right, I'm going to be tentative on this one, but I think, I know I am tempted, maybe I should put it that way, I know I am tempted to say that Sheila's life is more the sort a person might aim at than Herman's, and that the difference is that Sheila Sheila's contains remarkable achievements, whereas Herman's does not. All right, now, I don't say you have to go down that route, but suppose we do. Well, then a big problem arises. Once achievement is figured in, we have to accept that luck and circumstance play an important role in living an excellent life. Someone might have all of Sheila's motivation but fall ill or have a debilitating accident that prevents their achieving anything like what Sheila achieves. Or perhaps Sheila had to have a lot of good luck and meet the right people to do what she did. And then on top of that, what about people who, because of their impoverished circumstances, are not able to get the sort of education required in our society for substantial achievement? There was one Socratic school, the Stoics, who denied that luck and circumstance have anything at all to do with living excellently. A life was excellent as long as the person out of a desire to do the right thing, made all their choices in a rational way. A poor slave could lead an excellent life just as well as a rich free person. Of course, the latter, if living excellently, would achieve more, but that's irrelevant on the Stoic position because they didn't want 